Welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Marianne Cronin, author of the debut novel, The 100 Years of Lenny and Margot. Marianne, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for having me. Great. Well, if someone hasn't heard about your novel, The 100 Years of Lenny and Margot yet, how would you describe the novel? So I would say that The 100 Years of Lenny and Margot tells the story of 17-year-old Lenny Patterson. She's living in the Glasgow Princess Royal Hospital and she has a terminal illness. But Lenny does not let that stop her. She is an absolute firecracker of a personality. She's cheeky, she's irreverent, and she tries to fill her days with meaning by getting into adventures around the hospital. And in one of these adventures, she joins the hospital's art class. And this is where she meets Margot, who is an 83-year-old purple pyjama wearing fruitcake eating rebel. And between them, 17-year-old Lenny and 83-year-old Margot have been alive for 100 years. And when they realise this, they decide to embark on a project to paint 100 paintings, one for every day, every year that they've been alive on the earth. And each of these paintings comes with a story. And so the heart of the novel dives into the wild and wonderful lives that Lenny and Margot have lived that have taken them to the hospital and to the final days of both of their lives. Well, do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to writing the, the novel? I do. Yes, I was um, about 22 at the time, which was seven years ago because I'm 30 now. And um, I'd been to the doctors just for a regular health checkup and they found that my heart was beating way too fast. And so this kind of led to a lot of hospital appointments, doctor's appointments and kind of scary tests. And so while all of this was going on, because I was only 22, I started to kind of freak out a little bit um, because they couldn't really find a reason that my heart was doing all these strange things. And I suddenly thought, what would it be like to know that you were dying? And so this question just absolutely stuck itself in my head. And Lenny's voice really came out of my own voice of just from a place of fear, the sort of fear of death. Um, and then from the first draft, uh, from the first page, the first draft, it only took about three months. I just kind of absolutely ran with it. Well, what was your writing journey before you wrote this novel? Had you written fiction before or when you sat down to write this first page? Was that the first time you'd written fiction? Oh, I'd written a lot of fiction. I had just <laughs> well, finished. Tell, tell us about that. <laughs> <laughs> so I've just been writing since the moment I was handed a pen. Um, my mum just moved house and in her attic was this box full of stories that I'd written as a child. And often they're complete nonsense, but I've illustrated them and I've written about rabbits. And there's one called Lucky Lump that's about a sentient lump who's very unlucky. Um, <laughs> and then as I got older, I started to get more serious thinking, you know, maybe I could write a book. And so I wrote wrote this, uh, when I was about 19, I wrote this young adult fiction about guardian angels who fall in love. And I really fully thought it was amazing at the time, but now it just lives in a box under my bed. <laughs> um, and I'd started probably three or four other novels, but never really stuck it you know, stuck with it to the end. Um, so Lenny and Margot was a bit of a revelation for me because it just flowed so easily. And I was like, oh, maybe this could become something. That's great. Well, your characters, Lenny and Margot, use art to confront their illness. And uh, I've wondered, have you used art in your own life to deal with intense emotions or situations? Yeah, I have. I think because I've written a book about art, a lot of people assume that I'm a painter or an artist, and I am definitely not. My high school art teacher would definitely concur that I have no business <laughs> holding a pen or pencil. Um but for me, so I've struggled with um, migraines since I was quite a young child. And I get the kind where I lose my vision and then I lose my ability to speak and understand words. And so they kind of render me very, like quite a lot of head pain, but also I can't really do anything. And so right around the time that I started writing Lenny and Margot, I was going through this phase of having more time and I started painting. Um, and that really came out of just because of the migraine, not being able to read or look at TV or really take in any music or anything like that, but I could still paint. Um, so I grabbed some of my sister's uh, acrylic paints and some copier paper out of the printer and just started, you know, just painting. And I think that kind of subconsciously went into my mind when I was writing. Lenny and Margot because it just gave me this moment of peace. I wasn't thinking about the pain. I wasn't thinking about how ill I felt. I was just in the moment, just painting. Um, and I think that's what art does for Lenny and Margot. It gives them this escape from the hospital and from the kind of scary reality that they're both facing. That's great. Well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? 
Ooh, that's a great question. I would say definitely share your writing. This is something I don't do. I'm like a squirrel. I don't like people looking over my shoulder. I don't. I sort of didn't share Lenny and Marco with anyone for about three years. And I really wish I had because as soon as I shared my book with my friends and family, that was when I started to think maybe this could become something. And they also gave me great feedback on bits that were boring or questions they had that lingered after reading the first draft. Um, and so I'd say definitely do share your writing because it it's scary and, you know, it feels very exposing at first, but it makes such a difference just to have other people sort of looking over your work and being able to give you slightly impartial feedback. Well, were there authors or specific books or novels that inspired you along the way of uh, writing? Yeah, absolutely. There was um, a book called The One Hundred Year Old Man Who Climbed Out of the Window Disappeared by Jonas Jonasson. And I read that and just absolutely adored it. And then I also loved it exactly the same time, um, The Unlikely Pilgrimage of Harold Fry by Rachel Joyce. And I think both of those books made such an impact on me in my writing because they both deal with the question of what is a life? You know, what is one human life made of? What does it look like? And then also questions of what do we do when we come to the end of our lives and how do we leave a mark on the world? Um, and both of them really tackled these big questions, but they also did so with this kind of wry sense of humour, these moments of light, these moments of comedy. Um, and that's what I'm really drawn to as a reader. And so I think that was what I was trying to work on as a writer, because um, Lenny and Margot has what sounds like quite a sad and bleak blurb but it's got a lot of humor and a lot of light in it as well because um my instinct as a human whenever anything gets serious is to immediately make a joke and i think there's a little bit of that kind of british gallows humor uh, <laughs> throughout the book that's great well can you tell us about kind of the the path to publication for uh the 100 years of Lenny and margo once you you said you you didn't show anyone for three years but once you kind of polished it and and were ready to submit it how did that process work for you? Absolutely. It was such a long process. And um, I guess the other piece of advice I would give writers is don't wait as long as I did. <laughs> um, I started writing when I, um, when I was 22, so seven years between the first draft and publication. Um, and so, as I said, I wrote the first draft really quickly. And then I had this thing and I kind of didn't really know what to do with it. Um, I knew it needed, obviously, editing and rewriting and it got a bit boring towards the end in the first draft um, and I just didn't really know how to approach it so very slowly over the coming years I started to work in the evenings after work and at the weekends when I had spare time to rewrite and to reshape the book and then in about 2016 I was like okay I'm ready let's do this Lenny and Margot are ready to go out into the world and I don't know if there's an equivalent term in the US but we call it the slush pile here which is when you send your book to a literary agent unsolicited. So they haven't requested it from you. You find them online and then you just submit your first 50 pages to them. Um, so that's, yeah, I don't know what it's called in the US. Yes, it, it is. It's slush piles. <laughs> it's the same. Yes. Yeah, great. So I, I submitted Lenny and Margot to the slush piles and it was rejected by everybody. And everybody who rejected it, they gave me really similar feedback. And I know it's not that common for agents to give feedback when rejecting. So I knew that that was kind of a good sign in a strange way. Um, and yes, so the, these were about four or five agents who were in completely different companies and they all said really similar things to me. And so I kind of thought, who knows the market better than these people? Nobody. I'm going to listen to what they've said and I'm going to take my book out of the slush pile and I'm going to work on it. And so what I did was I created a folder. The, um, the book alternates between Lenny and Margot's stories. And so I split the book in two and I had Lenny chapters in one document. I had Margot chapters in another. And I completely deconstructed the whole book and then started writing from scratch and sort of blended those two things together. And that took that took another two years. Um, and there were points during that process where I was looking at my laptop and thinking, oh no, I've made it worse. And I've broken it kind of to the point that it can never be reassembled. Um, but by about 2019, I was like, okay. Hear that? Is that America cheering or a sausage patty sizzling to perfection? It's time to cheer for Egg McMuffin and fresh cracked eggs at McDonald's. It's time to wake up to the aroma of freshly baked biscuits and treat yourself to a real honest-to-goodness morning meal. Breakfast, it's on at McDonald's. Now enjoy a large iced coffee for just 2 bucks at a breakfast sandwich to make a meal. Prices and participation may vary. Cannot be combined with any other offer or combo meal. 
think it's I think it's there now. And one of the agents who rejected me had said, keep in touch. And I was never sure if she was just being polite, but I was like, you know what? I have nothing to lose. I'm going to keep in touch. So I sent her this new version of Lenny and Margot. And within three days, I was in her office in London um, and she was offering to be my agent. And from then it's just, um, yeah, it's just all very much in her hands. And the book went out to UK and US um, editors at the same time in September of 2019. And then here we are. Yes. Well, are you working on a new novel now? I am, yes. I think, um, so when I did my, when I was writing Lenny and Margot, I was studying for my PhD at the same time. And I think that one of the reasons that I enjoyed Lenny and Margot so much was that it wasn't the sole focus of my life. It was the side project. It was, it was something I was doing just for me, just kind of out of the, like a passion project. Mm -hmm. um, so when I started to work on book two, um, now that I'm working as a full-time writer, I suddenly felt this huge pressure because all my eggs were in this one basket and it was just one book and it had to be really good and so I spent a few months during lockdown trying to write this second book and my brain just wasn't cooperating whatsoever and so I realized that what I needed to do was work on multiple things at once so I'm now working on three novels and... wow that, that's an interesting that, that's an interesting <laughs> technique I haven't heard too many people mention that that's that's not a bad idea yeah, I think it's one of those things where it would either work for you or it wouldn't. Right, right. And for me, it's just that my brain, as soon as there's pressure on a project, it kind of starts to crumble. And right. I, I see I, I see only the negative things, only the flaws, because I'm like, this is my one shot. Um, so now working on three things, it's lovely because I can flip between books as <laughs> my mood dictates. Um, and in about a month and a half, I have to pitch these three books to my editor and she's hopefully going to pick one. Um, so it's not going to be three books to completion, but right. the first kind of 20, 30,000 words of each book is, is down now. So, Wow. That's, <laughs> we'll that's, see. that's an interesting, uh, 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 that's an interesting way to tackle it. I, I wish you luck on that. So, <laughs> thank you. so what novels or nonfiction books have you read recently that you enjoyed? I have been, one of the things that's taken me completely by surprise being, you know, an um, published as an author now is that people send you free books <laughs> I had no idea this was a thing and for the first time in my life I can afford books and people are sending them to me um, so at the moment I'm reading an advanced reader copy of a book called All My Mothers by Joanna Glenn and this follows a young woman who has a suspicion that she is not the biological child of her parents and it's all about her searching for who she is and the women who come along and nurture her and support her on that journey and kind of act as mothers at different points um, in her life and it's gorgeous I'm about halfway through it I can't I can't put it down um, and then I also read Great Circle by Maggie Shipstead recently which I think is big enough to classify as as an epic it's huge and it follows these two twins in the early uh, 1900s and they're rescued from a sinking ship and it follows their lives as they grow up um, in America and the female twin she wants to be a pilot and so she eventually learns to fly and so the book really focuses on her journey um, becoming a pilot and I would definitely recommend that I think it's either out now or it will be out very soon. That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they want to learn more about you and your debut novel? Oh, that would be lovely. I am. Um, I'm on Twitter. I am at it's M Cronin, and then I'm also on Instagram. I am at it's Marianne Cronin, and I post about the book. I post what I'm reading. I post quite a few pictures of my cat, who I recently adopted. <laughs> so, <laughs> if that any of that sounds good, then please give me a follow, drop me a message, and if I love talking to readers and listeners. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Marianne Cronin, author of the debut novel, The 100 Years of Lenny and Margot. The book is on sale now, so go buy a copy. And Marianne, thanks for doing this interview. Oh, thank you so much for having me. Great. Now, stay tuned for a brief excerpt from the audiobook of The 100 Years of Lenny and Margot by Marianne Cronin, performed by Sheila Reed and Rebecca Benson. Available from Harper Audio, wherever audiobooks are sold. I went to meet God because it's one of the only things I can do here. People say that when you die, it's because God is calling you back to him. So I thought I'd get the introduction over and done with ahead of time. Also, I'd heard that the staff are legally obliged to let you go to the hospital chapel if you have religious beliefs. And I wasn't going to pass up the opportunity to see a room I'd not yet been in and meet the Almighty in one go. A nurse I'd never seen before, who had cherry red hair, linked her arm through mine and walked me down the corridors of the dead and the dying. 
I devoured every new sight, every new smell, every pair of mismatched pyjamas that passed me. I suppose you could say that my relationship with God is complicated. As far as I understand it, he's like a cosmic wishing well. I've asked for stuff a couple of times, and some of those times he's come up with the goods. Other times there's been silence. Or, as I have begun to think lately, maybe all the times I thought God was being silent, he was quietly depositing more nonsense into my body, a kind of secret F.U. for daring to challenge him, only to be discovered many years later, buried treasure for me to find. When we reached the chapel doors, I was unimpressed. I'd expected an elegant gothic archway, but instead I came up against a pair of heavy wooden doors with square frosted windows. I wondered why God would need his windows frosted. What's he up to in there? Into the silence behind the doors, the new nurse and I stumbled. Well, he said. Hello? He must have been about 60, wearing a black shirt and trousers and a white dog collar. And he looked like he couldn't have been happier than he was at that moment. I saluted. Your Honour. This is Lenny Peters? The new nurse turned to me for clarification. Petterson. She let go of my arm and added gently, She's from the May Ward? It was the kindest way for her to say it. I suppose she felt she ought to warn him, because he looked as excited as a child on Christmas morning receiving a train set wrapped in a big bow, when in reality the gift she was presenting him with was broken. He could get attached if he wanted, but the wheels were already coming off and the whole thing wasn't likely to see another Christmas. I took my drip tube, which was attached to my drip wheelie thing, and walked towards him. I'll be back in an hour, the new nurse told me. And then she said something else, but I wasn't listening. Instead, I was staring up, where the light shone in, and the glow of every shade of pink and purple imaginable was striking my irises. Do you like the window? he asked. A cross of brown glass behind the altar was illuminating the whole chapel. Radiating from around the cross, were jagged pieces of glass, in violet, plum, fuchsia, and rose. The whole window seemed like it was on fire. The light scattered over the carpet and the pews and across our bodies. He waited patiently beside me, until I was ready to turn to him. It's nice to meet you, Lenny, he said. I'm Arthur. He shook my hand, and to his credit, he didn't wince when his fingers touched the part where the drip burrows into my skin. Would you like to sit? He asked, gesturing to the rows of empty pews. It's very nice to meet you. He said. Did I? Sorry. I wheeled my drip behind me, and as I reached the pew, I tied my dressing gown more tightly around my waist. Can you tell God I'm sorry about my pyjamas? I asked as I sat. You just told him. He's always listening. Father Arthur said as he sat beside me. I looked up at the cross. So, tell me, Lenny, what brings you to the chapel today? I'm thinking about buying a second-hand BMW. He didn't know what to do with that. So he picked up the Bible from the pew beside him, thumbed through it without looking at the pages, and put it down again. Excited for a road trip? Start it off right with auto coverage from American Family Insurance. J.D. Power ranked us number one in customer satisfaction with the auto insurance shopping experience among mid-size insurers. Get a quote at AmFam.com. American Family Insurance. For J.D. Power 2021 award information, visit JDPower.com slash awards. American Family Mutual Insurance Company, S.I. and its operating company, 6000 American Parkway, Madison, Wisconsin.